Welcome to another LHB Last Days Update. Today we're going to be taking a look at can people return from the dead to give us new revelations about heaven and hell? Would God allow this today? Well, in order to answer this question, we have to understand that the prophets and the apostles were given visions, some were taken to heaven and seeing what heaven looked like in order to write the Word of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament. But since we have the complete written Word of God, is it still valid for today? Is it possible for someone to die, go to hell, and then return from hell to tell us or warn us of what's to come? The answer is no. It's not possible today. If you die as a sinner in your sins without Christ, you go to hell. Or proper words, Hades, the temporary waiting place for the ungodly until the great white throne judgment, at which time they will be resurrected, stand before the judge, be read their sentences, and cast into the real hell, which is the lake of fire. No one upon death gets to come back and tell us what's going on because God is no respecter of persons. And if he did this with one or two or three people, especially those who are not even saved, in order for them to get saved, then he would have to do it for everyone because he's not a respecter of persons. Today you're going to be seeing um, some videos of people who claim to have divine revelations about heaven and hell and what happens and uh, what's to come. We're going to be taking a look at three different videos. The first, I believe, is Mary Kay Baxter and her divine revelation of heaven and hell. Second, we're going to see, I believe, it's um, Jesse Duplantis on his close encounters of the God kind. And then we'll see Don Piper in 90 Minutes of Heaven when he died and said that he went to heaven and all of this revelation. And there's something you got to notice about all of this, too. None of their stories, and everybody who claims to have gone to heaven or hell, none of them match. Mary Kay Baxter says hell is like a human body laying on its back. She even says that Christians go to hell. Even though the Bible says once you're saved, you're eternally saved, no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand or Jesus' hand. And that includes ourselves. We can't pluck ourselves out of his hand either. Once we're saved, we are eternally saved. So Mary Kay Baxter has a whole set of problems in her divine revelation on hell because it means that God has contradicted his written word. God said one thing in the pages of his word, but yet another thing in their divine revelations. And by the way, it, these divine revelations supersede scripture. You're going to hear a lot of the times they, uh, these people claim that God told them to write this down or God told them this. Well, if that's the case, then that means it's God's word, is it not? That means that word now supersedes the Bible. That means we better listen to it or else we're doomed. You see, you see the danger in this whole, I went to heaven and I came back, I went to hell and I came back. It puts these super elites on a pedestal and then not all people are flocking to them to hear their word and their revelation instead of the written word and what the Bible has said. So let's take a look at what scripture has to say concerning heaven and hell and those that have died and gone to those places or those who have had out-of-body experiences as the Apostle Paul did and have gone to heaven. Let's see what the written word says their record is. First, we're going to take a look at the rich man and Lazarus. In Luke chapter 16, verse 22, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, 
Have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham says unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is an account that Jesus gave to his disciples about uh, the dead rich man and Lazarus, a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And this, this is the account. The rich man was tormented in the temporary Hades, the temporary torment side of the underworld until the great white throne judgment. And the rich man was tormented in these spiritual flames and he was in pain and he wanted, he saw Abraham on the paradise side across the great gulf and was yelling to him to please allow him or somebody to go back to warn his family and Abraham says no they got Moses and the prophets basically no you they have the word of God just like you had the word of God no one's coming back from the dead to tell them anything and even if someone did they wouldn't believe okay so now we're going to take a look at Paul's account of heaven and what happened with him in 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 verse 2 and this Paul wanted to be modest and humble, so he talked. He 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 spoke in a third person, or uh, you know, so that way no one could know it was him at the time. He was humble. He was modest, but he was really talking about himself. And I want you to li listen to what he said. Second Corinthians twelve two. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for man to utter. Did you get that? It's not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say this the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me, seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So, yeah, Paul saw great things, a lot of revelations, a lot of visions concerning the word of God. He, he went to heaven. And he said it's not lawful for him to even speak about it. He only recorded that he went. He didn't say the details about what he saw. And just as a, uh, a precautionary measure, the Lord allowed uh, Paul to get a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to hinder him or buffet him so to, to keep Paul humble. Because it, you know, if you notice about these guys that you're going to see, they're very arrogant. They've been to heaven. They've been to hell. So they are the final authority in what you should believe. And Paul was avoiding all of that. He said, no, 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 no. I knew someone about 14 years ago. He didn't even mention his own name. That's how humble Paul was. And that's how much fear of the Lord Paul had. That he didn't want to mention his own name and the experience that God gave him. And that experience was for the written word of God that we have from Genesis to Revelation is completed. There's no more need for divine visions and, and, and trips to heaven or hell. or And... um as in the case of the rich man, he wasn't even allowed to leave hell to warn anybody. But yet today, you have people like Mary Kate Baxter, Don Piper, uh, uh, Jesse Duplantis, and a whole host of others that have taken regular trips over a period of 30 nights and 30 days, going to the underworld and back to heaven and seeing a whole bunch of things and just talking about it, yapping about it, and yet the great Apostle Paul couldn't utter these unspeakable things. Okay, my friends, why don't you go ahead and um, watch these videos. And again, please watch through the lens of Scripture. God bless, my friends. Heaven, hell, these are natural things. They're not fantasy. 
But you decide for yourself. I want to introduce you to my guest, Mary Catherine Baxter, because in April of 1976, at 2 a.m. in the morning, you had a surprise guest. Tell me what happened. Well, I was in prayer, and uh, Jesus Christ appeared to me in a human form. There was a brilliant light came into my bedroom, and when the light cleared up, there stood Jesus. And he said, I've appeared to you for a reason and a purpose, that I may take you on a journey and show you the depths, the degrees, the levels and torments of hell. He said, it's for the whole world, it's not for a handful of people. And he explained to me how ahead of me would be horrors and sorrows and grief, because he would actually talk to some of the dead in hell, and I would have to record it. Now, when you visited hell, was there a point where you experienced what people there are experiencing to a degree? Yes, I did. Tell me about that. Sid, I did that twice. It was like the 20th night into hell. I went to hell every night, three hours a night, for 30 nights. And 30 nights? You must have <laughs> been wishing this thing was over. Oh, yes, yes. And now, oh, now, we can treat it lightly right now because it's okay. back in 1976. Yeah. However, you do, I've noticed that you really don't even like talking about it that much, do you? No. Uh -uh. Why? Because I rem it bothers me uh, because of people that go to hell. They're lost and there's no more hope for them. Okay, first of all, where is hell located? In the middle of the earth, and it's in the pl shape of a human body, and it's on its back. And there's different levels, different degrees, different fires of torment. Uh, how does someone enter hell? Through a gateway. And there's gateways called tunnels. Like. They're kind of like tunnels or tornadoes, and they spin around and back again in the atmosphere. And they're hooked to the earth. And they call them tunnels, but Jesus calls them gateways to hell. And that's when they die and they rejected God. They actually descend down this gateway into hell. Okay, now back to that original question I okay. asked you about what it feels like to okay. be in hell as a person that uh, is separated from God. Well, it was on the twin, about the 20th night, and the Lord told me, he said, uh, you, um, you may not see me, but I'm here. He said, there's something you have to go through for this revelation because you've got to know that you know that you know that this is real like John the Revelator he said and when, when he said that he was gone I couldn't see him and an evil presence an evil demon they came over and they touched me and they said your Jesus has left you and uh, when they did it was like a million razor blades went through my body and I was in the spirit form but I had all my senses, you know, and my body was at home on the bed. And I understood everything. I, I understood uh, why people were in hell, the moans and the screams of the dead. And then another demon came up and they said, we're going to put you in this compartment. And Jesus has left you. And they were laughing and mocking. And I was put in an area where the fire was racing towards my feet in a jail cell. And Sid, it burned. I could actually feel it burning me. And I was in the spirit. And it was burning my legs, and it was burning up my legs. I was screaming and screaming. And I said, Jesus, where are you? And I began to quote the word of the Lord. And as I did that, the demons would scream, and they would back up. And I'd say, the blood of Jesus, I'm redeemed, I'm saved. What am I doing here? Because it was like I was a lost sinner. It really was. And, and then, Now, from what you've told me, uh, yeah. you were able to feel. Oh, Pain. yeah. Oh, my goodness, what, yes. What were you able to smell? The smell of stench, of sewers, smell of burning, rotten flesh. The air was so thin you could hardly breathe. Uh, and the, the awful part is the cries of the dead. Uh, the moans and the groans of the regret because they missed Jesus. And demons remind them that they could have had Jesus. They could have been born again and been saved from eternity. Damnation. Uh, could you tell me one person you spoke with there and what they said? Or that Jesus spoke with and what they said? Jesus spoke to many. But the main one that really was coming to mind was a woman, okay? She used to be a minister of God's Word, okay? And her husband committed adultery. He, he fell from grace. And so he went to her and told him that uh, he had been tempted and did the sin. Would she forgive him? And she told him no. And he went to the pastor and he asked the pastor. They all forgave him and prayed for him because he was tempted of the devil. And the woman got very angry and she said, Here I am preaching God's word and uh, I'm so holy and he's so sinful. But what happened? She quit reading her Bible. She quit praying. 
and she eventually let Satan in her heart with hatred and malice. And she took a gun and she killed the other woman and she killed her husband mm. and she killed herself. She ended up in hell. And uh, the affair had ended a long time ago, but she had such bitterness said that Jesus spoke to her. He said, you should have lived what you preached. You should have forgiven. You should have uh, understood. That's what Jesus told her. And he said, instead you yielded to the devil and sin entered into your heart. Hatred and sin. That's what he told her. Let me ask you this. When he was escorting you through... I, I didn't know what, though. I had no idea what... I said... In this position, like this, I don't know if you can see me or not, just, and I said, Lord, what, what? And I was sucked out of my room. I heard this, and I went, oh, I just, oh. Now, I don't know whether I was in my body or out of my body. I believe I was in my body. I was sucked through. I, went, I just went through. I just, I went, wow. And I realized I was moving at a phenomenal rate of speed. And I'm in this vehicle looking thing. It looked like a ski lift, not that you, it's not a ski lift, a, a cable car, you understand? Not something that you can hang your feet off of, an enclosure. And I'm traveling and I turned around and when I looked up, it was that same blonde headed angel that had told me. And I went, hey. <laughs> And he smiled at me. He said, you have an appointment with the Lord God Jehovah. And I thought, man, am I? Man, I mean, whoo, I mean, we are rolling. It looked like a, it felt, I, I called it a chariot without any horses. An enclosure looking type thing. I mean, going at a phenomenal rate of speed. And all, all of a sudden I felt the thing slow down. And it come to a stop. And ladies and gentlemen, when that door opened, the shock of my life. You see, heaven is wonderful. It's a big place. He hasn't destroyed paradise. It's all around, all completely around that holy city. It looks like a, it's a planet. I walked out and saw mountains and streams and trees and flowers and the fragrances. I looked. And I, didn't, I just was amazed. And I come out. I'm walking. I mean, I'm physically walking like I am on this platform. Beautiful, gorgeous trees and streams and water and mountains. Totally comfortable. Yet I saw snow. Yet not cold. I, nothing brown. Nothing it's lush, beautiful, gorgeous valleys and mountains and streams. And I looked at him and I said, what am I doing here? He said, you have an appointment with the great God, Jehovah. He said, we must go to the city. Now, paradise is very big. It's huge. So we were walking. We started to walk and I saw trees lined up on the side of the river of life. Ladies, I knew it was that. With thousands of people under them. I mean, it just goes forever. It just seemed like forever. And these, how do I say this? Th these contraptions were bringing people and these angels were coming out and assigning people. And I noticed that I was in my clothes. I was in the clothes that I had on. But these people that were coming out of these machines looking, I call it a machine looking thing. Some had robes of righteousness, beautiful, glorious. And they got out and ran, just took off running straight to that city, man, in that line. And there's some that got out, they didn't have a robe on. They had like, like a gown on. And they would head for that throne. Everybody wants to get to the throne. Everywhere you look, you can see that throne. I mean, it just, it's just everywhere. You can see it. It's high. And I saw them, and all of a sudden, they'd get out of the line, the people with the gowns, and they'd walk over. And they'd go and eat those trees. It, it was eating, looked like fruit. And, and they would take the leaves and do this. And I asked that angel, I said, what is that? I said, those people can't go to the throne of God? He said, yes, the great God Jehovah is merciful. I said, but in my theological mind, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But well, that's true that the minute you walk over to that other side. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, there's some people don't live for God the way they should. But you see, God's merciful. He still helps them and touches them. But they look different. They got to be taught. If you don't learn it here, 
you are going to learn it there. Now I'm telling you. And he was getting these gowns are beautiful. And when I got back to the earth, I began to research it and I found out that God gives us a robe of righteousness and a gown of salvation. There's a difference. And some people don't live close to God, but yet they know Jesus in their life. They could do so much better. They're going to go to the throne, but it takes time for them. Everybody's trying to get to that throne. And as I was walking, I looked and I saw a man. He went, hey, Jesse. And I knew him immediately. He was thick barrel chested man. I said, you, you Abraham. He said, yes. He said, this is still my bosom. He said, I meet everybody here. So I hadn't got to the gate of the city yet. He said, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. Glory to God. When I said that, he went, glory to God. The angel went, glory to God. He just starts a chain reaction. Well, please welcome back a very interesting guest. His name is Don Piper. He's written a book called 90 Minutes in Heaven. And uh, it's good to see you, Don. It's welcome. good to be here. Welcome. Good to be anywhere. Yeah, to be breathing, huh? Yes, absolutely. You were dead for 90 minutes. What happened? I was. I was on my way to church to lead a Bible study uh -huh. on a Wednesday and uh, crossing a bridge in the middle of nowhere, rural bridge, an 18-wheeler across the center stripe and literally ran over my car, just crushed it with me in it. And, uh, and you died? I was killed instantly. Instantly. Just, uh, instantly. it was, you know, 100 miles an hour of impact, so uh, there was no tunnel. I was just... There, one one second here, last breath here, first breath there, the gates of heaven. That ain't a bad thing. No, it was a really good thing. <laughs> I didn't really want to come back here. All right, what's it like? What would you see? It was uh, the most real thing that's ever happened to me. I uh, I was standing at a gate. Of course, the scripture tells us there's 12 of these gates, and mm -hmm. I was at one. I was surrounded by people I had known and loved in life who preceded me in death. And uh, what a great reunion heaven is. Well, you, you saw family members? Family members, teachers, yeah. uh, classmates that I'd gone to school with that had died uh, at a young age. Uh, my next door neighbor was there. Uh, a lot of people that I loved right. here and cared about here, but they, I probably wouldn't have expected some of these people to greet me at the gates, but they were there. And I think it's because they helped me get there. Okay. Yeah, God sent them out to greet me. Well, all right, tell me, what that's the gate. Now, you got inside. What's it like when well, you get actually, in? Well, actually, I'm going through layers of aroma, uh, uh, layers of uh, angels. They're mm -hmm. all over the place, uh, ministering to the people of God, bearing up the people of God. I went through music, uh, unlike any I've ever heard here, probably thousands of songs at the same time, mm -hmm. and yet there was no chaos because they all fit together. They were all glorifying what are the God. angels like? Some had wings, uh, yeah. some didn't. Um, they were magnificently beautiful, and um, they um, they were bearing up people. They were surrounding me. Um, I guess the most amazing thing about was the w sound of their wings. Mm -hmm. You can actually hear the flutter and the kind of the holy well, whoosh of their wings. Jesus talked about the beggar Lazarus that he was carried by the angels. Yes. W were they carrying you? Yes, him? absolutely. They were carrying you. Yeah, there was one in the car with me. Um, yeah. When I actually came back 90 minutes later, I was holding the hand of, of an angel. Uh, that's the only one thing that really sustained me during that time. So they were here, and they are here, and they were there uh, mm -hmm. to greet me and to bear me up. So the angels are magnificent servants of God. We don't become angels, of course, when yeah, we go to yeah, heaven. Right. But I was carried by the angels to heaven. Uh, were they? I hate to use the term subservient, but I mean the, the people of God are supposed to be uh, on top of them. They are. 